Thank you everybody so much for your great comments on my last video where I showed building this 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery. In this video, we're gonna answer some of your common questions and go in and make a couple of little improvements. Here we go. Hi everybody, I'm David and welcome to my channel where I like to DIY projects that are renewable energy and energy efficiency. This video is a follow-up to the build of this 12 volt battery. If you haven't seen the build of this 12 volt battery, I suggest you go back and check out the previous video. I go into a lot of detail on exactly how I built it and put all the cells together. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't sell my builds. These are just my own personal projects and I'm just sharing the project builds with you uh, so that hopefully we all share and grow and have some fun together. But I'm not suggesting that you build it exactly the same way. It's more about uh, all of us improving as a DIY community together. Now, if you do want to purchase one because you don't either have the time or tools to build it yourself, there's some excellent manufacturers such as Battleborn or Victron. If you want a high quality battery that you can purchase off the shelf, go check out one of those. I will leave some links in the description below to a couple out there. The switch mechanism is protruding out through the lid. It's not hiding inside. Now I did that on purpose because I want the terminals to be dead. So when I wire everything, there's no live voltage. And only after I have verified that all my torque settings are good, then I can go back and I can turn it on. <laughs> well, there are two temperature sensors built into this BMS. I was able to see them in the app. And if you check out that previous video where I did the discharge test, you'll notice that the battery compartment went up by six or seven degrees throughout the course of the test. And the BMS automatically adjusted its amp hour rating during the test. So it's a pretty nice BMS for this project. I care a lot about extending the life cycles of the battery. And I wanna make sure that I'm not stressing the battery cells hard. Now the batteries can get warm if you charge them at a high rate. So I limit it to 50 amps, primarily for the charge purpose. Now, if you decide that you're going to build this battery for yourself and your application requires high amp discharge and you know that you personally are going to have a low amp charge, you can certainly beef up the nickel contacts, you can add a bigger circuit breaker and a bigger BMS. It's your build, you get to do it any way you want to. Some people had a concern that the Loctite was going to interfere with the electrical connection between the bolt threads and the brass terminal. It's true that Loctite is not going to be as good of an electrical conductor as the metal on metal contact of the thread to the threads of the brass to the steel bolt. But my question that I suppose I'm tossing back out to the community to help me answer is how much of the electricity is gonna be flowing through the steel bolt to get to the other side of the ring terminal instead of just going straight from the brass directly to the ring terminal. I mean, that seems like it'd be less steps and less resistance. Use a piece of nickel strip directly onto the cells and this nickel strip is not cell level fusing. Now in the past, I have built projects such as my ammo box battery, which you can check out in a previous video, and that has cell level fusing. In this project, I didn't do that. Now the reason why I chose not to is because these are lithium iron phosphate, so they're a little bit safer of a chemistry compared to some of the others. And these are factory new cells, they're brand new cells, they're all from the same lot, same manufacturing date. So I guess I just don't see the need for cell level fusing and there'd be nothing wrong with adding cell level fusing if you choose to. Is this pure nickel strip or nickel plated steel? There's a lot of fake nickel out there or nickel plated steel that's advertised as pure nickel. Now I purchased this from 18650 heatshrinkcellholders.com uh, that's Keith's store. Uh, Keith is down in Rhode Island, and since I live in Massachusetts, I've driven down there and met him in person. Now, I trust Keith, and I think that this is pure nickel because he said so. But I'm going to take some of this, I'm gonna cut it up, we'll put it in some salt water tonight, 
and tomorrow we'll check back and see if it has rusted out. So I'll put that footage in at the end of this video. Now guess what came in? These are the ring terminals for the inside connection point. Now I stated in the previous video that I ordered these because I wasn't happy that I had to drill one out to make it fit. Here's the contacts inside and this is the ring terminal I need to replace because I had to drill it out. When we look inside here, this is the brass terminal and here's the crimped connection that I had to drill out to make that connection work. But there's now very little meat left on the edge of that ring terminal. The new terminals finally came in and here it is side by side and you can see how much more surface contact will be made with the brass when I go to add this on. Now personally, I think most of the electricity will flow from the brass directly into the ring terminal. Does the electricity want to flow from the brass terminal through the threads of the bolt and then into the ring terminal on the other side? Or does it want to flow directly from the brass into the copper terminal? Now maybe I'm thinking of this differently and I'm sure if I was running 300 amps through this assembly this would become a problem. But in this case I'm more concerned with this bolt loosening up and falling and rattling around inside the case. And please let me know in the comments below if I've got my thoughts on this completely backwards. Now the concern everybody had was this positive bus bar. It's very close to the cells. Now the outside of the cell is actually negative and it's wrapped with a piece of plastic heat shrink but it's fairly thin and everybody was concerned that it was too close. And you know what? I have the ability to make an improvement so I will. I'm, I'm thrilled to get comments that are helpful this way. Now here's just a piece of packaging from the Loctite uh, container and it looks like I can get it under there. So there is a little bit of an airspace, but it's close and we have a chance to make it better. So let's make it better. So first thing I'm going to use some Kapton tape and this is uh, the same tape that I've wrapped most of this battery with and we'll just fish it underneath. Yep, just like that. So that wasn't too hard. And I agree with everybody, this is something I should have done in the beginning. But we're going to make the improvement now. Alright, so that's one layer. Let's get another layer on there. Now if anybody's wondering why I'm not just pulling this straight up in the air, it's because I don't want to stress the nickel back and forth, back and forth. Alright, so here we go. I'm just going to slip in this barley paper. I've already stripped the adhesive and I'll get it pushed right up against that black plastic in there. Great. Well now we have two layers of Captain Tape and a layer of barley paper. So now I'm not seeing a way that could short out. So thank you everybody for leaving that comment. So again, we'll take our routed out piece of cutting board. We'll put this right on top. Now I've got some thread lock on there. So personally, I think this connection between the brass and the ring terminal is where the bulk of the electricity is going to flow when I'm limiting this pack to 50 amps. So personally, I don't see that little bit of Loctite in there as a problem. I view it as a good thing to make sure that this bolt doesn't loosen up and become rattling around inside the case. And if I'm thinking through this wrong, and uh, this Loctite really is a problem, 
then uh, please link to an article where somebody's tested this, uh, some kind of white paper or lab test, so I can read up on at what point this becomes a problem. The last question that I received that I'd like to address in this video is does the BMS have a low temperature cutoff? Now I'm not sure why I've received this question so often uh, because my garage is a heated garage. But if your application calls for having this in an unconditioned space and it's in the winter and you're charging it during the winter, <laughs> then yes, a low temperature cutoff might be an important thing to you. Now, I would advocate that you have controls in place to have this battery or any battery inside a heated enclosure if it's going to be in a cold environment. I think that is more important than whether or not the BMS has a low temperature cutoff. Uh, for example, I will leave a link in the description below to my friend Bill's project. Bill built his own battery box that is heated automatically, keeps his batteries at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, all winter long and he is in the cold Vermont winters where it quite often gets to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit up there. Now that's cold. Well here's a piece of the nickel strip that I use for the battery and the question is is it pure nickel or is it nickel plated steel? So steel would rust. So let's try to scratch this up a bit. I don't know if this is correct process. Please let me know in the comments below how this is supposed to be done. Give it some more surface area. I think that's the general idea. Get as much surface area as possible. Alright, so that looks like fun. Let's go stick that in some salt water and see if it rusts up. I have some hot water in a glass cup and we're going to add some salt, dissolve it, and toss this in. I don't know how much salt we're supposed to use but I'm guessing that's enough. There we go. And now we'll see if we get some rust for tomorrow. And it is actually <laughs> 0, 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit <laughs> or negative 17.6 degrees Celsius. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at the frost buildup on it. <laughs> All right, well, let's get this to the garage. And after 24 hours of sitting on the windowsill, Let's look at the nickel. Well, I don't see any... We're looking for some rust, right? I don't see any rust in there. Yeah. So I would say that this is pure nickel. So thanks Keith from 18650 for selling us some pure nickel strip. Here's that frozen battery. There's the frost buildup. You can see all that condensation on there. That can't be good. But all in the name of science, right? <laughs> all right, well, we'll have some fun on this. Look at all that frost. So it's definitely cold. The circuit breaker is currently off and we've got the power supply and ISDT hooked up. I just turned on this cell phone so that we could see the app. And let's take a close look at what we're doing. Temperature, negative 17 degrees Celsius. There's two temperature sensors inside the case. So let's go ahead and turn the circuit breaker on. There we go, should be on position. Yep, so that's on. And then over here, what we'll do is, it is a 4S, looks, um, 
but we're not on lithium ion, we're on lithium iron phosphate. And let's go ahead and start that. Okay, so it's going to try. Then over here, uh, under voltage, or I mean, it did it, under temperature protection. And right here, that shut off. So this, so the BMS did its job exactly as it should. The BMS shut off and stopped this from being able to charge. This doesn't even see it anymore. I just shut the circuit breaker off. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you everybody very much for watching. If you'd like to purchase any of the cells or the BMS that I've showed in this video, uh, please go to batteryhookup.com and you can use my coupon code DAVIDPAUSE for 10% off and that is part of the affiliate program which helps out the channel. Thank you very much.